This is the second of the lectures on biomes. So I'm just going to click through the uh, slides up to now that we've already gone through. So we've talked about what a biome is. We've talked about how the shape of the earth affects the distribution of rainfall and winds and temperature. We talked about the Coriolis effect deflecting the winds. We've gone over climate diagrams, how they're set up and how you interpret them. So in the climate diagram, if the precipitation line falls above the temperature line, then you know there's adequate precipitation to grow plants unless the temperatures drop below zero Celsius, below freezing. Uh, we briefly talked about what soils are like in the terrestrial biomes. And so uh, here's a soil profile. And we went over that. And then we went over tropical rainforests, the fact that the soils lack nutrients and some of the adaptations for dealing with the nutrients. We talked about the plants, the epiphytes growing up on the branches of the trees. We talked about their, soil, their climate profiles. We talked about the difference then between the tropical rainforest and the tropical dry forest, where the tropical dry forest is found how it will lose its leaves during the dry season, and how you can see a distinct difference in the rainfall pattern on the climate diagram. And then tropical savanna, the climate, the soils, talked about how it's basically a two-dimensional landscape instead of a three-dimensional landscape, looked at how it has seasonal precipitation as well, and where it's located partially determined by the soils. So now we're at the next biome. So we're going to do three biomes in this particular lecture. We're dealing with the desert biome. The desert biome, as you know, because of the placement of those Hadley cells, is at major bands at about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude, and occupies about 20% of the Earth's land surface. Uh, in the desert, water loss usually exceeds precipitation. The soil is extremely low in organic matter. There's very low productivity. There's very little to put into the soil. Plant cover ranges from being sparse to, in some places, totally absent. There are very few animals in the desert, but there's quite a bit of diversity in those animals. So the population sizes are small, but there's quite a variety. So there's, there can be high biodiversity. And there are very strong behavioral adaptations to the extreme conditions within the desert. Humans are increasing their occupation of the desert, extracting groundwater, putting in golf courses, um, uh, mining it, using it for uh, storage sites, for nuclear waste. So the human impact has increased drastically. As you can see, there are very strong adaptations. Here are some um, uh, Cacti and euphorbs. Cacti are found in the New World, the Western Hemisphere. Euphorbs are very similar plants with the same adaptations that are found in the Old World deserts like you would find in Africa or in Asia. Uh, you can see that the leaves have been reduced to spines, which will help shade the surface of the cactus. And uh, most of the animals you can see are not out here in the sunlight. Most of the animals are going to be nocturnal. The climate diagrams for the desert then consistently show that the temperature line falls above the precipitation line. Precipitation is less than 10, uh, uh, 10 inches a year uh, in total, which is going to be less than uh, well, anywhere from uh, here we've got up to what 124 millimeters um, of precipitation. Could be up to um, 250 millimeters of precipitation still classified as a desert. So we have these wide bands of desert across 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south approximately of the equator. So we've got an example here of the Mongolian desert. This desert is a cold desert, which means that it'll drop down below freezing for a certain proportion of the year. And then the annual drought is during the growing season. So keeping there's more snow sitting here, and you'll get a flush of growth early spring when that snow melts. But other than that, um, it's going to be in desert conditions. The rest of these deserts, the, the Arizona desert and this desert in uh, Sahara, you can see that the temperatures are, um, are peaking during the summer months, but there's not adequate precipitation. 
Mediterranean woodland and shrubland is also called uh, chaparral in the United States. It occurs in all continents except Antarctica, but it's relatively restricted in range. It has a lovely climate. It's cool and moist in the fall and winter and spring, but it can be hot and dry in the summer. The soils tend to be rocky. They erode very easily. They're fragile soils, but they have moderate fertility. The trees and shrubs that live here are typically evergreen, so they keep their leaves all year round. Many of the plants have adaptations to fire because this is a fire-prone biome. There's a long history of people living here. You think about people living around the Mediterranean, Southern California. Uh, this is a very popular biome for people to live in. Therefore, it's been vastly cleared for agriculture. This is what the biome looks like. You can see there are scattered trees. These trees are very fire resistant. And then you have open meadow areas. You can see the barks of these trees are very thick. This is where cork trees grow. Cork trees, the cork comes from the cork bark. They take the peel the bark off sections of the trees to harvest the cork. Um, and that way, when a fire comes through, a ground fire comes through, it'll not harm the, the trees. When we look at the climate diagrams, then we can see we have um, temperatures consistently above the freezing mark, um, nice temperatures all year round, warmer in the summer. So this is the summer period and we get a summer drought. So it's warm and dry in the summer and cooler and moist in the winter. Um, nice moderate temperatures year round though. Um, when we look over here in uh, Australia, we can see that this uh, climate diagram starts in July, July, August, September, and then we start to get the summertime in November, December, January, February, and March, where you have the summer drought and the winter rains. Temperate grasslands, they have a very widespread distribution. The rainfall is higher than the rainfall in the desert. So I said the desert typically can go up to 250 millimeters, and then the grassland can go up to a meter a year. They experience periodic droughts. The soils tend to be nutrient rich and very deep. These are the richest soils in the world are found in the temperate grasslands. They're thoroughly dominated by herbaceous vegetation. Herbaceous vegetation, not woody vegetation. This is herbaceous plants such as grasses and forbs that die back to the surface every winter time. Because it's a temperate area, it does have winters below freezing. There are herds, large herds of roaming ungulates in North America that would have initially been the bison, but we've replaced them with the cattle. The bison were removed. Uh, this is a North American temperate grassland. Uh, these are uh, two North American um, uh, pronghorn antelope. This is North America's only antelope. Uh, this is the fastest land animal in North America. You'll find it out in the Great Plains. And this is a typical uh, short grass, mixed grass prairie um, out in perhaps eastern Colorado or um, uh, in that up in Nebraska, western Nebraska, up in that area uh, where you do find these antelopes out. A lot of it has been uh, irrigated, so they've tapped into the groundwater and irrigated this biome, and it is being used for agriculture. So we have lost a lot of this biome because of those thick, rich soils. When we look at the distribution of the biome, we are, we are moving further north and south of the equator. So um, this is a climate diagram from Manhattan, Kansas. Would, this would have been the, on the Kansa Prairie LTER site. And you can see that uh, here we have rainfall that's adequate for plant growth. Um, and you've got a temperate climate. So you have periods where the temperature is inadequately high for, for growing vegetation in the winter time. So you have a, a cold and dry winter period and then you have uh, precipitation increasing in the spring. Um, because it's dry in the winter and you start to have thunderstorms in the spring, uh, you get a lot of fires in this biome right in the springtime when they start. And, uh, and you can see the same thing would happen here in the uh, Russian steppe and in, the, uh, in this uh, spring area in China 
you have uh, is very dry and then when these summer storms start you'll start to get uh, high levels of, of thunderstorms and lightning strikes and you will end up with uh, high levels of fire.